All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, so, I introduce you to Gonzalo Lopez from UCL on Neurology. Uh, he's the next postdoc of repurposing himself for transition to become a startup founder or an old company founder. Uh, so, he's been researching about neuroscience, but before that, he was a software engineer. Um, he's going to show us some mixes between all of his experimentations. I think you'll be better than me to present yourself. Thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you a lot, Cedric. I uh, want to thank Cedric a lot by inviting me here. Uh, I think this is one of the, we were discussing yesterday, uh, this is probably one of these like uh, coincidences in life, but into a very nice opportunity. We kind of met by chance in the MoCo. We went by computing and uh, we kind of exchanged our experiences and uh, we are now collaborating. I'll talk a little bit about what we are doing uh, in our collaborative projects, but I'm really happy to be here and then meet a lot of you. I never did uh, robotics officially, but I was involved in many robotic projects and uh, um, in Portugal where I was at, uh, many friends of mine, robotics departments and so, so not yeah, everyone was, here is also in, in robotics. Yeah. Some are specialists in psychology, yeah, yeah, yeah. perception, of course, sociology. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of I think a lot of these fields also, I mean, uh, a friend of mine that is in robotics, he says robotics is really an excuse for him to try whatever he likes to try. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a mishmash of things. And neuroscience is actually the same. And uh, this friend of mine is actually also working on neuroscience. And he says the same about neuroscience. It's kind of a an excuse for us to think about the questions we want to think about. Because uh, no one knows what it is. Right? The same with neuroscience or robotics, it can be many things. So it's, yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so I, I want this presentation to be also like that. It's an excuse for us to talk about the things we like to discuss. So we should make it into a discussion. We should break into discussions whenever we want. Uh, feel free to ask. I mean, I have kind of three stories that I prepared to tell you, but we don't have to go through any of them. We can break off in any tangent at any point. I think that's more productive. Oh, oh, I'll see. I'll tell you a bit of my um, path, like how does a computer scientist end up in neuroscience and then what is the connection to robotics? And so I'll tell you a bit about that. Um, so, yeah, and, and I'll tell you the story. So I went, I did my PhD at the Shepalimo Foundation, which is a new neuroscience institute that uh, started in uh, Portugal, Lisbon. Uh, basically, a millionaire uh, left a lot of money to, to start to start this institute, and uh, Portugal doesn't have a particular history of neuroscience uh, research, but this really changed the vibe of that because a lot of um, um, high impact researchers from the states went there, uh, and they changed the playing field a little bit for Portugal. Um, and now, I my supervisor got a moved into London, into this new Sainsbury Welcome Center, which is also a new neuroscience institute, but this time in London. And a uh, similar idea is a privately funded research institute. Um, a lot of people want to invest in the brain now. This time will be same thing. But anyway, I'll tell you what I was even before this. So my story, as Cedric was saying, uh, I was a software engineer, and I was really fascinated about um, intelligence, like I, as many people read sci-fi and uh, fascinated about building an AI, things like that. So yeah, for me, it started with the question of what is intelligence, like where you were a long time ago. Uh, and I was really, I'm really a bit of a son of the 90s. So the, at the time, people were making comparisons between symbolic reasoning, like this kind of disembodied ability to think abstractly and solve chess problems or math problems or however you want to call it, and the debate between uh, more situated cognition, which is really where robotics mm -hmm. kind of sits, where even with simple rules, but if you are coupled to an environment that is rich enough, you can uh, be, you can do a lot of complicated things uh, just from that interaction. Uh, and I had a lot of, um, I was almost doing a PhD in AI, in uh, logic programming, so very formal kind of theorem proving kind of thing. But then I was really fascinated by this side <laughs> and um, I got the chance to join a company. <laughs> so it was very, even before neuroscience. Um, so I was in a company called the White Dreams, 
Uh, and they were doing a lot of cool things with um, interactive technologies. So they were trying to mix computer vision and computer graphics to develop this emerging field at the time of augmented reality, where you kind of um, project digital information into the physical world and you have means for with your own body to interact with, with that. Um, and I'll show you, these are three videos I want to show you of the kind of things we did at the company. Uh, this was in 2006, from 2006 to 2010, so it's really already a long time ago, I guess, more than 10 years. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but anyway, so I'm not sure if you're going to see very well with light. We'll see. Okay, so, so the first project is we, um, that I'm going to show you is a project we did there with um, the precursor to the Kinect 2. So you know these Microsoft Kinect cameras, the 3D cameras that kind of give you the, um, the rec a reconstruction of the local space in front of the camera. So we use that to create uh, interactive um, software like this, where basically it's kind of like a minority report interface, where the user can, with his own body, kind of interact with some object that exists in, only in the virtual space, but he can, it's registered to his real position, so he can kind of manipulate it uh, in real time. So the camera, actually, if I can go there, it's funny, we were collaborating at the time. This was a camera from a small company called Canesta, and they had nothing to do with games or interaction at all. They only did like a topographic, um, you know, when people are measuring, uh, they're playing like roads and construction work and survey of the terrain. So they were doing cameras for that purpose. Uh, but they saw the rising interest in people in video games and interaction to use these cameras, and they collaborated with us to do this project. CES in 2010, and then six months later, Microsoft bought the company, and this camera became the Kinect 2. It was a um, time of flight camera, so that was a cool thing. Um, this company was quite special because it allowed it. There was a lot of people that wanted to just experiment. Uh, and that's also how I like to, to do my own research and development is I just want to like play around with things. And a lot of people were interested in mixes between technology and uh, the performing arts. So we also had the chance to do projects like these. So this is um, uh, another example of interactive, the kind of interactive technology we made at the company, but this time applied to a dance performance. So we kind of made a particle system where the, each little word that is floating around the, um, the dancer is basically a little agent that has like a, a sense sensor for sensing its surrounding uh, field, which includes the body and the other words. And it can <coughs> interact with, them, with each other. So they are attracted to the dancer, but repelled from each other. And they kind of... Um, <coughs> the dancer kind of explored the space. What I really like about this project is that the dancer learned to use the technology to his benefit. So I'll tell you what happened here. So you see the words are attracted to the dancer, but he discovered that if he approached the screen, so actually his, the detection system fails because it's not there anymore. Because there's no artist in there, only the repelling forces happen. So you get this explosion that actually we didn't coded to be like that. It's kind of, he discovered by improvisation that he could do this. He could pull it off by hiding in the front of the screen and kind of letting the system do whatever it wanted. It's kind of like a real time performance. This is super really cool. Um, and finally, we also um, dabbled a bit in um, robotics, even at the company. Um, we had this project, uh, which is this second there, kind of, um, it was an interactive tour guides, uh, kind of robotic tour guides. Um, it was a system of robots that um, took people in a building across the building. So they, they, they had to learn how to localize themselves across the building, uh, take, taking people to meet, meeting rooms, and they could coordinate themselves. There was like a group of, I think, five robots that, um, yeah, five and they organize themselves to kind of decide which one is going to take the guest somewhere and things like that. Uh, what I like about this project, well, it's, it's a robotics project, which is really nice, um, but it's we kind of designed the system 
such that uh, each robot, it's hard to see here, it's only a little bit of a sketch, but each robot kind of has a model, like a virtual model of the environment. It's inside that virtual mental model that they have inside. Uh, and it's updated in real time, the model, uh, to kind of try and reflect what is going on. Um, and this was a cool way for us to think about um, how to represent intelligence in a way, like how to represent, like how, why do, why would you want like an internal model of, for, for making decisions and acting in the world? It was, it was cool. We can talk about more about that. As I said, if you want to, things, um, yeah. Um, do, do you track uh, only uh, the body of the uh, dancer? Or all these, uh, all the so, movements, or so, just, uh, so this is a simple shape. set. So it's um, the lights are controlled. So it's mm -hmm. you get a, sec a very easy segmentation of the contour of the of the dancer mm -hmm. and the point. So it's kind of like a, you, you have a polygon that describes the whole shape of the dancer mm -hmm. and the, the vertices of that polygon kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, attract the particles individually. So it's like you actually have like a yeah the whole contour you can go <laughs> around. Uh, the particles can interact with the whole shape. Yeah, uh, yeah if he opens up, yeah, it, it will, yeah, it okay. kind of goes around yeah, okay. up to the resolution of the camera, of course, that you can distinguish mm -hmm. these things. But it's very, but we're not trying to assign semantics to the body parts. Right? This is the hand, or this is the foot, it's just a shape that is there. You yeah, can do whatever you want, yeah. You can do the handstand and do these mm -hmm. crazy things, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's very simple, but it's, it works. Um, it, it was very nice to see how the dancer explored it's this, uh, even just a simple, simple rules. Okay, uh, so I would sit at this company and was having a lot of fun, and then um, a lot of things happened, and um, it was time to leave. <laughs> I can tell the story. It's a long story. But I can tell it to you later if you're interested. Uh, and then I was deciding again. Okay, what what should I do uh, next? And I thought I maybe would pick up on the AI PhD that I left behind. And uh, around that time, uh, I was thinking about this, and uh, then I found out that this new PhD program in neuroscience was starting in, in Portugal. And they were really asking for people across all the fields. They were asking for uh, mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, psychologists, medical doctors, bio people from biology, molecular biology, and so on, to join engineers and, and others. It really wrote in a way that was very appealing to me and it was important. I had no idea that you could even do neuroscience in Portugal. So I was kind of fascinated to explore that that uh, facet and I kind of dived in. Just just felt right. Uh, and they took me in. They were uh, excited to have me, which was really cool, nicely. Um, and I basically got a year of brainstorming about how biology works in general because I, I was not doing biology at all. And this was a biology PhD program, so the, the, the whole point is you were going to interact. It was an experimental um, program, so I was going to do experiments with animals, with live uh, neural tissue, and so on. Um, so my contribution to them, which I'm going to show you now, was uh, bringing my engineering skills to address an issue that is very relevant for neuroscience these days, which is the problem of behavior. So you want to you want to relate the activity of the brain to what animals are doing to kind of understand exactly like in robot. It's like, a, it's like observing like a already built ideal robot that is behaving and brain. Uh, so you want to kind of understand that relationship. So you first need to understand the behavior actually, so, because if not, the relationship is really hard to, to establish. Uh, and uh, what I brought to them was kind of um, what we were doing with the humans in, when I was working at the company was kind of analyzing behavior in a way because you're measuring what people are doing. You are, um, uh, when you are creating these interfaces. So the idea was to use these tools to also analyze the behavior of other animals. It doesn't have to be humans. Um, so I kind of brought those engineering skills to address that. And it was in this context that I made one software that became half of what I did during my PhD, which was Bonsai. It was a programming language for me to rapidly prototype um, 
behavior studies. Uh, and I can show you now, I have to, I think the best way is to show you what it is like. Um, so this is kind of half of what I wanted to show you. So it's basically a visual programming language um, where the idea was to kind of, um, so as a programmer, as a professional programmer, I feel still very frustrated with the way we program what we want the computer to do today because it's a lot of text, there's a lot of complicated syntax, and sometimes you feel you're doing a lot of work for very little return. And uh, because I want to explore things very fast, I wanted for myself to be a bit uh, faster in that exploration. Uh, for the specific domain of these behavior studies, um, but then it later turned on to be much more generic than that. But anyway, there are many other visual programming languages out there. It's not by any means uh, anything. But um, one thing that I quite liked is what Bonsai tries to do is give you a very direct access to sensors and actuators. And what I mean by that is if I want to access, let's say, a camera in my computer, I can just kind of pick a video capture device, I place it, and I play it. And I have the video of the device. So this is this camera that I have here, one camera. And we needed to combine a lot of things at the same time. So if I want another camera inside, I can just place another node and I'll pick another camera. I'm going to get the front camera now and kind of play it. And this kind of starts two processes running at the same time. And the idea is you have here two devices that are uh, each working at their own uh, pace, like each of their own clocks. They are kind of. Um, but I wanted to combine them. So the, the idea of bonsai is languages still follow the idea of the control loop, where you have like a loop that is going through a series of instructions. A little bit different because the metaphor is more reactive. So the what happens is you have events. So you can think of these source. You can think of these nodes as sources of data. So then they are generating images. So this is a sequence of images that is arriving at whatever frame rate the camera can give you. This is another um, data stream. Um, but then you can kind of combine them. So I can make sure they have the same resolution. I can pick the formats. Um, so you, can, you could, for example, OK, let me combine them together and kind of put them side by side. And the idea is you can have operators <coughs> that visually control how the events are propagated. So in this case, what I'm creating here is kind of a compound stream that takes the latest events that are arriving in the from each data source. So I have a camera sending out a sequence of images. I have another camera sending out another sequence of images. I kind of combine the latest events from each data the stream of the events, find the latest uh, frames in time, have kind of like two kind of I have two I have now the in the in the, in one single sequence I have synchronized in time um, the messages from each one. So that's the the approach that I followed with onsite. And, but then it doesn't work, of course. It started with video, because video is a very cheap uh, way of analyzing behavior. You just record what the animal is doing. But you can have other sensors. So you can have your mouse if you want. Get the coordinates and so on. Uh, and Bonsai will kind of show you a quick representation. So you, now I have the coordinates of the mouse as it moves in the screen. I kind of plot them in a graph kind of gives you an easy way to access the data you want to see. And you can record it easily. I can record it to a writer. This will write the video file into a video. <coughs> I can record this numeric data to a text file, things like that. Um, but there's also the actuation side. because So in systems neuroscience, when you are um, analyzing behavior, um, you don't want to just analyze the behavior, but you want to perturb it because you want to. It's it's like a control system. The animals are controlling, 
of their parameters, like biological parameters, to achieve their goals. And the best way to kind of try and understand what they are doing is to challenge them, like perturb them in a way. So you, one technique that is becoming, so in the beginning, neuroscience was a lot about investigating the stimulus response properties of the brain. So you present some stimulus, you look at what, how the brain responds to that stimulus, and that already gives you something about uh, what the brain is doing, maybe. But uh, what is becoming more popular is kind of like these closed loop approaches, where actually what you are doing is you analyze um, the behavior of the animal in real time, and you build as the animal is behaving, which allows you to then control. It's a closed loop, so you can control parameters of the the way you close the loop, like the gains and uh, the response properties of your system. And then, as you make perturbations, you can see how the animal. Um, and that will hopefully help you understand better what is what is really going on. So it's important that you can um, also in bonsai build these things. For myself, I wanted them. Um, so you, you also have a lot of effectors. So I didn't explain this very well, but so you have sources of data. These colors kind of tell you the category of the nodes. So sources are these purple operator purple nodes. <coughs> the white nodes are transformations, so you're going to transform the data in some way. There's a, many of them that I can show you in a bit. I think it's clear to a um, projector, to a, to a microcontroller, to control some motor. For example, what I can do is that I, can, I have my X and Y mouse positions and I can kind of uh, rescale them to fit the range. So I'm just going to take my screen as 3,000 pixels, and then I can rescale this one to 180 degrees. Um, and, and for example, now send them to a servo output, which is controlled by the Arduino. I have a little Arduino here. I have these little two servos connected. Uh, and uh, send this one also. So you can kind of. This uh, <coughs> is pin eight. So the idea is again the same way that you got easy access to the. You just want to say, oh, I just want to send a command to my servo to set the reference position. Um, and I just want to specify the minimum that I have to specify such that I have, um, I don't know if this works. It's not very stable platform. Basically, you have the, yeah, the, the bonsai is now just reacting to the messages from the mouse and rescaling them and sending them a little servo. Um, but again, this is, of course, nothing is nothing new at all. It's just the way, for me, it was just the way to make it simple to specify something like that, where all the initialization, because for this to happen, you have to initialize com ports, initialize connections to the mouse. Like there's a lot of things. And I want to have that be exposed in a very direct way. It's just, that's what I care about. I just care about data streams. I don't care about how they're, how the computer, what the computer needs to do in order to connect to them. I don't care about that. I just want to get the data I want and send it to where I want it to go, and that's it. Um, yeah. Uh, so one cool thing about bonsai, this is the, the details. There's many details behind this of how I wanted it to work. One that is very nice is that bonsai is actually a compiled language. So many, well, not all, but many of these visual programming languages that you will find, they are um, because they also want to be very dynamic, they are interpreted. So they have some kind of runtime engine that is uh, evaluating your program and kind of translating that live into the computer language. But Bonsai does that by compiling it. So it translates <laughs> this visual program into machine code. So it, and it is doing this. Um, you can see the output of the mouse is a point. It knows that type, the x is an int, and so on. And the way it relates to that, to the question you are asking, is this building, the way the code is generated, I have control over that. So that's 
Bonsai controls the how the way the code is generated and built. The, you're actually generating code as you are. It's it's as if you are typing, on like your little uh, development environment, uh, but you're just putting this schematic. Because I have control over that, the way the code is generated, you could, in principle, actually do exactly as you are describing. So I could take uh, a schematic of this, uh, an embedded microcontroller, and upload that when you kind of run it. So that's actually one of the future directions that I, I want to go. Because it's really, it's really possible. But I just didn't have time to go into there yet. But that's, that's definitely one thing I, I would love to do. We talked about it, for example, for doing like uh, programming FPGAs or like these kind of, which are also very reactive in a way. So they're, it's kind of, you could think about it in a similar way that you're responding to events that are happening. Um, um, yeah. Are you, uh, have you a similar function as, a, do you know, a simulink? Yeah, I yeah. just simulink. Can, can you, um, can you input some uh, control low, uh, with box? Uh, yeah. So. To this is exactly, I guess it's related to the, to the discussion. So Simulink is also very used to create embedded uh, control processes. So um, you could, oops, I, in fact, we can, we can try and make a little one. Um, like I was thinking of trying, let's see if I can do that. But it's more like, um, for example, let's say I wanted to control the, um, the servos now from some kind of feedback loop. So let's try to do one thing. If, if this works, it doesn't work, I will play. <coughs> Maybe I don't have enough light for this, but we'll see. Maybe. So, yeah, so there's a, uh, I'm just using um, the nodes in, in real time as well. This is useful for calibration thresholds and so on. Uh, so I'm just going to get rid of some of the this is black pixels. It's good enough. Um, so I'm trying to isolate like this little green pen that I have here, uh, and kind of just quickly let's see if this even works. A little bit more light. Uh, they would leave it, leave it like that for now. We can try. We can. Yeah. Let's see if it doesn't work, but maybe it will work. Um, so let's just get the largest object. I'm not explaining everything, every detail of the operators that I'm putting here, but it's basically I'm segmenting based on color, the image, and kind of extracting the largest object uh, in there. So if that works, this will be the little pen. Uh, I also try to make it so you can. Compose, this is still a bit of a work in progress, but you can also compose. So as you see, one thing about bonsai is you can inspect every data that is going for every operation you are making. So you can see this is a conversion to a HSV space, which I can explain on that is later. This is the result of the segmentation. This is the result of the analysis of the You can kind of drop it on the image and see what you are following. That little, little thing works. Not working now. It's okay. Support for drawing the trace as well, but it's okay. But anyway, so this I think kind of works. So imagine if I wanted to make the following control loop, which is let's center, let's take the X position of that, of the object, and kind of turn it into a control signal for the sensor. So now what I want to do is the following. So this position in pixels is going to go from zero, okay, like horizontally is the maximum thing. And I want to keep the object, the horizontal axis, so that it keeps it in the middle more or less. So I'm going to scale it to be if, seven and minus seven, for example, degrees. So the idea is that if the object is to the right, send it to the left. And if it's on the left, send it to the right, just keep it like that. Um, and just send that into, um, so we can kind of start 
the servo. We have to initialize it in the middle just for this to work. And then, sorry, just a bit. And then I will explain where I want to go to answer your question. <laughs> so we just integrate these uh, control signals over time. So in theory, you should have So actually, it's a bit tricky because I've broken it. In real time, I don't know what the hell is sending. Yeah, I sent I sent some negative value. I guess to it. I guess I need to clamp it. Sorry because it can go very negative very fast. So if I force it to be there. Would you have me? Only understands to give you the position. Yeah, yeah, I just want to send, like, let's say, go to the left, go to the right. But I, I want to, I have to send an absolute control position. Just sending the, the position. I want to kind of, um, yeah, it's still not. For some reason. Yeah, no worry about that. It's just funny. It was just mm -hmm. funny if it were done. I guess it's going away from it. It's funny. I think I need to reverse. Yeah, let me just try this. If not, I will have to move on, or else we'll spend too much time here. But yeah, this doesn't really matter. I mean, you get you get the idea. If we had a bit more time, we could. But I want to tell you the rest of the story, so I will move on in the interest of time. Like a, a process like this, where you basically do something that maps some inputs to outputs and kind of tries to keep them in a reference uh, position. And then you is the same question as Cedric was asking. You could compile, control, take control of the compilation of this code and kind of put it into a into a, like a, a microcontroller or things like that. Um, now the bonsai is more at the level where you can prototype these things quickly, kind of see if they work with simple systems like that. Um, then you then you could you could imagine doing something more hard if you wanted. Um, yeah, I can tell you. I, I will skip ahead in the interest of time. But there's a, if you if you're interested in this topic, I can I can we can talk later. And uh, there's definitely a lot to to talk about here. Okay, but anyway, so that's about half. Um, so now I want to tell you about the, so this was what I brought into the neuroscience community to kind of uh, look at behavior and try to understand what animals do. But then I actually had a scientific question that my supervisor challenged me to ask. <laughs> um, because I was interested, I mean, I, I went to neuroscience to kind of take inspiration uh, from the brain to try to understand what intelligence is. Um, and I, but I didn't really know enough. At, I didn't really know enough to ask like a very specific neurosin, like the one that you would. That's why I had to brainstorm a lot with my supervisor. And then at the end, we agreed. Okay, I have a challenge for you. He said, uh, "I want you to ask." Um, let's see the presentation. To ask, um, what does motor cortex do? And. Uh, <laughs> non-primate mammals and the reason he, he, he put me this question is because he he was um, struggling with this question for himself for the four years before I started um, because he was in the lab I can tell you his whole story it's also a long story 
about how he, he got to do this um, because he's a physicist, also turned neuroscientist for different reasons. Um, but he was struggling to understand um, what was going on with our idea of motor cortex. And uh, he was very um, impressed by that um, because he was studying, his lab was studying um, the role of motor cortex in skill learning. So the, the idea, so one of the ideas about motor cortex is they allow you to control voluntarily precise fine movements. So you're kind of, um, and if you want to learn to do a skill, let's say if you want to play the piano or learn how to play tennis, or if you want to learn how to do surgeries, precision surgeries, your motor cortex is very much involved in that. So his lab wanted to understand how that works in, in mammals. His supervisor uh, had an idea which came from birds, which in birds, there's a, a very popular model organism in neuroscience that is called the songbird. These birds that sing um, these very elaborate songs that they learn from their parents. So it's like the, the, they're not in, built in what their um, the progenitors kind of sing and then they try to imitate and they kind of um, develop their own little, and if they do really well, then the females will kind of be happy and make with them. Uh, in that model organism, uh, the very fascinating understanding of what the components of the brain of the bird are doing to enable the birds to learn that song. And there's parts of the brain that are used, they, they kind of have a very complete kind of reinforcement learning model, like supervised learning model for how the, how the birds learn this. Basically, what they're trying to do is um, they're, they're trying to listen to, they listen to their parents, they kind of make a model of what the song should look like, and then they try to reproduce that song, and it's kind of like a minimization process, and they do a trial and error. So they, there's a part of the brain that if you, that is responsible for generating variability, the things that you try, responsible for precise timing uh, of syllables. And it's relatively well understood. And the supervisor of my supervisor, he wanted to know the part of the brain uh, of the bird that is responsible for, um, that is equivalent to cortex, more or less, in terms of the structure and in terms of the anatomy and the evolution, is the part of the brain that is responsible for timing. So it's, so in the bird um, model, for them to sing the song, they have to generate these very, these syllables of the song that are deployed very precisely in time. And if you, if you destroy by lesioning the the part of the bird brain that is responsible for that, what you see is the, the song becomes scrambled. So the, the syllables are still correct. They're still saying the right kind of words, but they're in the wrong order or they are in the, they're not put in the precise time. And this area uh, they thought was homologous to motor cortex. So they, they wanted to go into the mammals and kind of, um, see if the lesion motor cortex in mammals, do these animals have problems in timing? Uh, now, what happened is my supervisor, he, he did his lesion experiments in, in motor cortex, and what he found out is that if you remove motor cortex from a mammal, it's more or less. <laughs> So just to be clear, motor cortex was discovered in 1870, so more almost like 150 years ago. And the definition, the reason why it's called motor cortex was because in Fritsch, Edward Heitzig and Gustav Fritsch, they um, discovered for the first time a region in the brain where you could stimulate electrically with low currents and produce movements. So if you stimulate, it's kind of like these points over here, and actually it's the whole region, these frontal regions. Um, if you apply um, pulses of uh, electrical of current to these tissue, to these parts of the tissue, you get um, specific body parts. Of, in this case, a dog. They, they the schematic of the brain of the dog that they use to stimulate. You get specific movements in body parts, and you have kind of like this map. So you may have, you may know of this idea of the homunculus, which is kind of like the map of the body that is extended over the surface of the brain, and you can kind of stimulate specific points and you get specific muscles to move. 
uh, in that area. So they called it the motor cortex because of that. That was the region of the brain that generated movements. And they thought the cortex at the time, even in this time, was considered to be the source of consciousness. So they thought they had found out, they had discovered at the time, they said they discovered the bridge between consciousness and the body. <laughs> That's what they, the, the link between the soul, <laughs> they thought about. However, even at, uh, not long after, people started experimenting and they found out very weird observations that fell from this. So this guy, Friedrich Holtz, um, he, in the dog, so in the same um, species that they discovered more and so if you say you're from the part of the brain that commands movements in the animals, then there's an easy experiment to do, which is we just take it off and see if it really is the area that is responsible for movement. And what he found out is that pretty much the dogs are moving normally. So he did these huge lesions of cortex and he actually presented live animal. This was before there were a lot of ethical review boards and they actually brought the animals to the conferences. So he presented, so this, is, this is a conference in London in 1881 where they brought the live animal that they posteriorly dissected and they put it in there in front of the scientists and said, okay, look, here's the dog. He has no, I've removed the cortices from both sides and look at him, and he was walking around, like he would respond to stimuli, he would do everything that a normal dog would do. He was a bit clumsy, but yeah, but he was, but he was still clearly behaving. Um, so yeah, he said that this is evidence that, um, he said that I could find in the brains of dogs that is solely responsible for either perception or movement. It's more like a graded, he said he found deficits of general intelligence, which is very vague, the way he phrased this, that they, these dogs were really, they were more clumsy and they seemed a bit more dumb than the other normal dogs. But in terms of executing movements and perceiving the stimuli, they looked pretty normal. But, uh, but this guy was opposed by uh, another uh, very famous uh, neuro, neuro, neurologist, neurophysiologist, uh, David Ferrier, that he really um, kind of directed the field in a, in a different, uh, so he presented, at the same conference, in this case, so Goltz was a bilateral lesion, Ferrier was only a unilateral, only on one side, and uh, he presented the monkey as well. He brought the monkey to the conference and said, okay, I did the same lesion, and uh, here is the monkey. And the monkey was basically paralyzed on one on the opposite side. So if the lesion was on the left side, his right limbs were completely down. And there was a lot of uh, medical doctors at, uh, at this conference, and they basically said, oh, this is like human patients. This is exactly what happens if you have a stroke you get this paralysis um, of the limbs and they so clearly so we don't know what's going on with your dogs uh, but at least in, in humans and primates um, clearly the motor cortex controls a voluntary movement and they cannot move without it so it's okay and so the this kind of split this defined the canon so the understanding is yes in humans and primates, motor cortex pretty much uh, directs movement. But then this difference between, as you go to non-primates, which is dogs, cats, rats, and all other, pretty much all other mammals, um, there's a lot of research showing that actually nothing pretty much happens in terms of the movement execution. Nothing major happens. There's little subtle differences, um, but nothing major happens if you remove motor cortex. And this dilemma was still kind of, it's, we're still thinking about it. I, project. I'm going to skip this part in the interest of time, which is the explaining the differences between the connections between the, the cortex to the spinal cord. If you're interested in this, ask me later. Uh, this is just to bring another point of how you can move without motor cortex. This is a video of um, Pat, so a very famous uh, preparation for studying spinal cord. So if you're just interested in the central control of locomotion in the spinal cord, um, people would decerebrate cats. So they would remove the, the entire cortex and all the subcortical structures up to the brainstem. So they leave brainstem and spinal cord. And then cats will uh, happily um, locomote on a treadmill. So they, they require, they will not initiate movement, but they will respond to the, to the feeling of the, the treadmill um, rotating. And they even adjust their, their gait to the speed of the treadmill. So this was the one thing that was very impressive to see 
is it's not just a passive so they, they can clearly maintain some coordination between limbs some at least in terms of the overall response but then as you see as this treadmill speeds up you will see it switches the posture to kind of like a galloping like at some point it looks like it's really galloping and then you can do this without without uh, cortex so clearly there's independent control systems that are uh, happening here and of course in terms of engineering um like control if you think about hierarchical control systems like this makes a lot of sense like you have some lower level controller that is taking care of a lot of the details some higher level influencer that is doing something but we don't know what so talking about it so the challenge was to kind of understand okay if we just forget about this simple idea of okay it's just about controlling movement or not controlling movement but we just want to figure out what is the contribution of the cortex so clearly you don't need it in the mammal in this non-primate mammals you don't need it to just move around but you think it must be necessary for something so what is it so first we wanted to reproduce some of these studies so we actually um put some animals running in an obstacle course so that's what this is kind of like a popular test so um, this is the setup that I, that I, that I built um and some of the animals that i run um, and what you can see is in the top, I'm showing control animals, so an intact brain. And on the bottom, I'm showing you animals that have been lesioned bilaterally in the primary motor cortex um, areas. So they are removed by this excitotoxic um, compound that you can use to kind of Lesion. Um, you can do so. This is just to show um, a very important study of lesions is the um, problem of plasticity. So people will say that cortex kind of is like you see in stroke patients. So you, if you have a lesion to cortex, they recover slowly over time, and the idea is that other parts of the brain kind of take over. The functions of the lesion areas and there's this robustness so the story goes um, and so one of the criticisms that we faced initially in the work is that oh but your lesions are so small and clearly the, there's a lot of cortex going on you would hope that they would um, um, the other parts maybe are taking over the motor cortex and that's that's why you're not seeing any any deficit so we kind of um, made we have to extend the, the, the range of the regions. Uh, look at it one more time. So in the beginning, you you see you we start seeing if we make really big lesions that actually damage even subcortical structures. You start seeing some of the symptoms that Colts described in his dogs, which is this clumsiness. You see the, the, the rat is pretty clumsy as he's going. And a normal rat will not be as clumsy. You see it's slipping. So this, this you don't see in a normal um, uh, animal, even in the first phases. They are pretty agile. But the funny thing is that they, they clearly learn to kind of um, overcome that. So once they get to learn the environment, they start moving more quickly and they they and they become really good. And in fact, they become as good as the as the normal animals. Uh, Just to be clear, here you've got your motor cortex lesion. This is more than one. Did you say basal ganglia? Here, yeah, yeah. Here, here. In this case, yes, because so so in the difference in terms of techniques. So uh, here we're using apotenic acid. So this is um, a compound that kills only cell bodies in the specific target area that we, we delimitate. Um, and here is just cortical, so there's no subcortex damage here. Here is a is a more the, the point here is to show how much you can do even without a large part of the telencephalon. So basically, you remove. This is a different technique. So this is aspiration. So you just uh, take the, the tissue off, um, and you remove also subcortical um, structures for sure. But it's extending not just into the motor cortex, but into parietal cortex um, in the middle of the visual areas. This is important, the reason why the here, so this is kind of a side tour, but there's projections from cortex to the spinal cord all the way down to here. So even 
not just in the motor cortex, but if you go down, in the, at least in the rat, there's still projections down to the motor area. Not, not motor areas in the spinal cord, but down to the spinal cord that could influence the movement. System, yeah, yeah so, so we wanted to kind of make sure that we're not, it's not because of those that yeah. we are missing out something fundamental. No, you don't need it to learn to, to move uh, normally, at least for the learning aspect of it. And, but there's this initial clumsiness, which is cool. And we can talk about it later, what it can mean. Anyway, this is kind of like some graphs showing the performances of many animals uh, over time. <coughs> I can talk about that. This is how many animals we did uh, of each lesion type. This is the sections of the brain kind of showing in more detail what the lesions look like uh, in both cases. So here you see this is like with the abotanic acid where you kind of uh, only target the cortical uh, uh, part of the, of the brain. And then this is with the, with the aspiration where you clearly go into basal ganglia and so on. And we can talk, talk, talk about this later. Of the mass. Of total mass. Oh, in which case? In the uh, extended? In both. In both. Yeah. Is it like one in five percent or much more? It's, um, it's a good question. I don't know my head I could calculate them. But it's kind of like an accurate, more, this is, this is accurate. This is kind of a schematic way of of representing this. So if this is, if you think about cortex, so one about cortex that is important is that it's mostly about the surface area and not so much because the cortex in terms of depth, it's pretty much the same everywhere. It kind of folds around like that. Um, but it's mostly about the, the area that you lesion. So if you think about it in terms of area, um, then motor cortex, I mean, at least primary motor cortex, extends, yeah, like, not, not quite a third, but a bit less, but if you take out both, maybe, because it gets larger here, it's um, more than 50%, maybe. In this case, yes, in this case, it's, you see you're going into the, you're actually lesioning subcortical areas. So basically, what you're seeing here is text, then these uh, white matter tracks, these are the, the colossal, fibers of the corpus callosum that connects the yeah the hemispheres and there's a lot of fibers connecting different parts of the brain and you have the support X, basal ganglia and so on. Uh, and clearly here you're going uh, into all these uh, areas. Um, but the animals still still learn uh, quite well. There's definitely a, a little effect of these slips that I was telling you about the uh, clumsiness. So but we can discuss this later. Uh, there's a an effect The extended guys understand whether this is an effect of cortex or the subcortex because you don't know. So this, we, it's not clear whether this effect is coming from just the cortex or from the basal ganglia, for example. But in any case, if you do these big lesions, you do start to see uh, an effect of slips, but still it's not like a major, it's not like paralysis, like it's not like the animals are paralyzed, they can clearly move, they can clearly uh, do the task, they are playing, so the motivation for them, they do hundreds of trials of crossing back and forth. The reason why they're doing this is they're looking for water, so it's kind of like how they get water in the side, get the water, go back and get them. They can keep without various populations, so perturbations um, in the environment, which was one thing we wanted to. Another thing that is pointed out for the role of cortex is this flexibility that ability to deal with, dealing with changes to the environment, like re reorganizing your behavior to deal with something unexpected. Um, and extended the assay to allow us to modify the state of each um, step so we can kind of make it we can break steps so now when they hit a step rotates we kind of breaks it's like you're stepping on a broken step and you kind of slip or something like that um and after training and this is after training and i'll, I'll get that um so now that the, this these steps are broken the two middle ones you see this little icon tells you where well 
it rotates. And they're still pretty good. I mean, dealing with, um, with navigating the perturbations, you can shoot. I think I have, it's like a more challenging condition where we release all the middle ones. And um, it's like a slower, slow version of the movies. And you see the navigate. In this case, you see this guy was slower than the other guy. But there's a lot of variability in these animals. So in fact, there's um, in other cases, I think there's another group coming up. The opposite. Uh, let me maybe it's another guy. Yeah. So this is uh, another pair. It's because there's many. Ah, uh, by the way, these these are all paired. So the they are litter. They are same litter. Kind of reduce variability in. The, <coughs> But anyway, in this case, you see it's the opposite, actually. The control is more to uh, one the lesion just flew over without this. So they, they do a lot of things, too, when, when they realize that they, they have to deal with these issues. And that, that's a, that's an, this animal has an intact brain. So there's not much of a difference. And in the end, if you just look at the plots uh, of their performance just in terms of time to cross, and they can show you other metrics. Um, they are pretty similar. What is that tracking them on the other side? It's just water. So they're looking, they're looking for water. So the, every time they cross, they can get water on the other side. And whenever they feel like it, they can come back and get, get water only in alternation. So they kind of go back and forth hundreds of times, right. like in half an hour. Right. Um, OK. So I'm going to skip this. We, I'm going to go back to this later. Um, so this is kind of like the mechanism in which we are doing this. I don't know. Maybe I think I, think I put it as kind of a Frankensteinian version of the presentation. But this is kind of the explanation of how we do this. So the there's motors that kind of the goal was without because the animals are doing they're going back and forth, and we wanted to have the ability to modify the state of the step every time they go. Uh, we can change the state of the step. And the goal was to have it done in a way that the animal cannot tell what the what's going to happen. So, the, so we, we didn't want to change anything visually about the step or, or sounds, like if there's anything that is mechanically about it, we don't want that. So we just made a simple locking mechanism where the servos kind of go in, they lock a step in place, and then they switch off. Uh, and the step is stable. And then whenever we want to open it, we open the servos, they switch off, so there's no noise, no nothing, and uh, we, we kind of um, let the, the steps roam freely. Uh, so it's very, um, there's nothing about the steps that changes really. They, it's just when they support their weight on the step, it will either break or not break. Um, and so this allowed us to do different tests. For example, we can randomize. Uh, let's say that you are make, to make the, the task more challenging, you can every time know what's going to happen. So maybe they will struggle more with that uncertainty, uh, that added uncertainty. Um, and so one thing, yeah, this is kind of like the more detailed analysis of what they are doing. As they experience over and over the step being unstable, they actually start adjusting their posture. So you see, this, this is an animal like stepping when the world is fully stable for like a week. And then he's very confidently just walking over. So he just, you see them approach the step in this very confident manner. And once you start exposing them to the instability, they actually adopt this more cautious posture. So they kind of lower their center of gravity. They know something's gonna happen. And you can measure this by tracking where the tip of the nose is um, when, at this moment when they, they step on it. This every dot here is a trial, and this is um, how far away. So progression is how far away their nose is. So that if they both lower the nose and bring it back. So this is how far away the nose was um, over each trial, and you see everything is stable. So they kind of go forward with the nose. They become very confident, but then as soon as the steps become unstable, they kind of push back. And they stay there, and then we can flip it over on stable again, and they learn again, oh, and now I can trust this again, random, and then you can kind of see, it's actually a bit lower, it's in the middle between this and that, almost. Um, 
This is like a more summarized version, so you can plot all the trials with like a heat metal histogram between the two conditions, and you see they clearly separate. One animal, this is for all animals, so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. They, they show, a very, again, a very similar, exactly the same behavior of doing this, adapt, adapting this, this approach. And now, so we found this out about the ends table, so we want to look in the random, what happened. In the random condition, um, there's no information about the state of the steps, so they don't know what is gonna happen, right? So in a way, as they approach the obstacles, what are they gonna do? Because they don't know what is going to happen. And indeed, if you compare the stable conditions with the unstable conditions, the way they approach the obstacles is the same because they don't know what, what, is, what is happening in that trial. It could be stable or unstable. And if you would compare it with the early sessions, they would be more cautious. But within that, that day, they, they, they approach it in the same way. However, a cool thing is that they're actually doing a dynamic adjustment because what you can ask then is, okay, but let's make a clever separation. Let's not split it just based on stable or unstable, but let's split it based on whether the previous trial was stable or unstable. So let's say that before I slipped, and now I'm going to go again, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I slipped before. Am I going to adjust the posture or not? And the answer is yes, you kind of, you kind of adjust. So they, they very slight, very small effect, but definitely significant, and they, they kind of adjust. And if you make it more extreme, well, this is kind of the extreme. But the thing is, both controls and lesions, again, do it. So, the, um, so even the lesions, on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, they are kind of constantly adapting the way they approach the obstacles based on what their expectation is of what's going to happen, whether they think it's going to be uh, stable or not. OK, so, so what is, it? is there any difference at all? So this is the point where things got interesting. Uh, and, and my supervisor really wanted to, for a long time, he, he, he wanted to look at this, which is the first time. And we did, we did kind of look at this in the beginning, but then we kind of went back and looked at it in more detail. Is that the first time that they encounter the instability? OK, so this is a different condition now. I'm going to show you the video of what happens. Because in the random, they kind of know that it's broken. So they know that it, this thing is rigged. But the, the very first time that it happens, it's a different situation because they have no idea that this can even be a possibility. So it's an unexpected thing. It's different than being uncertain. So what happens in this case is you have different kinds of behaviors. One behavior is this behavior. So this is the first time an animal ever in his life encountered a broken step. And he kind of adopts this investigatory um, behavior. They kind of look, what the hell happened? Like, I don't know. <laughs> so that's one, one behavior. The other behavior that they do, yeah, they will investigate crazy. The other behavior that we sometimes see, this is still the same, actually, yeah. The other behavior we see is compensation. So this is, again, uh, another animal, a different animal. Uh, the first time he encounters the, the step, and I'll play it in slow motion. So what is going on is he's going to, at some point, detect that the, the steps are broken, and then he immediately switches to a new kind of motor um, action, which is jumping. So uh, this is broken, uh, let, me, let me get out of here. It's just reacted fast. Um, but then when we went to look into what the lesion animals did, uh, we saw this. Just kind of like they... <laughs> I'm gonna show you, I have also a slower version of this. So it's kind of like a similar situation to the previous guy. So this paw slipped. But then what they do is they kind of interrupt. So they, there's a detection side to this because they understand that something happened. Well, understand, I don't know, but they clearly respond to the break, but the way they respond is different than the other ones because they will, and I can show you now, many animals that control with intact brains and lesion brains, and then they kind of discuss uh, what is going on. This is kind of our classifications, which we can debate them. It's kind of tricky, but these guys are compensating because they're kind of like jumping like the other guy or kind of dealing with it in any way. And these guys are investigating. But the other guys, when they encounter it, they kind of just stop. 
and kind of stay there. And here, when you're talking about the legion, are you purely motor cortex? Purely motor cortex, it's not, not the extended the basal Yeah, it's not the basal ganglion. Okay. It's purely the motor cortex, the primary motor cortex lesions. Uh, and this for us was kind of striking in a way that they, that this difference was, this is kind of like the, for all the animals. So we kind of classify the movies in what, what the responses are. And it looked pretty consistent that, um, that overall, the trend seems to be, and by the way, this is now sorted. The way I organize this histogram is the biggest lesions are at the top. So there's also another aspect I didn't mention a lot, but depending on how you inject and how the spread of the acid goes, you get lesions of different sizes. Now by the lesion size, and in these last ones, there was actually uh, some issues injecting in some sites where the pipette got blocked. So you got some very much smaller lesions. I could show you the plots of the size of the lesions. And what you see is kind of like the big lesions, they kind of all halt. They stop, they, do, they, they have this halting behavior that I was telling you. And then as you go to the smaller lesions, they start again kind of compensating. Um, so there is some kind of... What, what, what does it represent exactly? The this time is time. So, first so time from first contact, this means the time when the animal is hit the, the step for the first time. So we detect when that is, so they touch the step, that's time zero. And then, right, see that they actually, all of them, they take a bit to do something because they're, they're, they don't immediately understand that the steps are broken. They're kind of, as you saw before, they kind of keep walking for some frames. And then at some point they, they initiate the response. Um, so they, they, they keep walking for a bit and then the colors indicate when, they, when we consider this is like a classification uh, procedure that we run through a different people uh, where you kind of label like what, what are they doing. Uh, and it, yeah, and it just tells you how long, this is in seconds, so it tells you how long they stayed in each of these. So the model of the operation is actually making them more curious, They're spending more time investigating, <coughs> more ah. it than when they don't have it. When they have it, they spend a lot of time investigating. Yes, that's another observation. Yeah, they seem to be more curious than the cortex. That's that's another consequence of that. Uh, but they will they will compensate as well. Uh, and these guys, this is the boundary line. Um, these guys um, mostly just interrupt whatever it is they were doing. They stop what they were doing, but they don't initiate or prepare like a, a response, either investigatory or compensatory. They don't. Um, we went to look also what happened with the with the extended ones, so with these uh, very big ones that go subcortically. Like what do they do? And um, for the most part, we found that they kind of do the same thing of the halting. So they also kind of stop what they're doing, very similar to the big lesions. But we found another thing. We found another behavior that we had never seen before again on these extended ones. Two big lesions, guys. A very different thing that got us puzzled for a while, but then it kind of we can discuss what it is. So it's they don't even seem to notice. So then after a while they notice. So so what happened here, and this is why I have to put this into a continuous video. So just to make it clear. These are the biggest lesions that we have ever made that, that extend way into almost the visual areas and very deep into the into the subcortical areas. Let me show you here. So this is the first time they encounter the, ob the obstacles. They're moving very fast. But you see, now they're doing something different. They're just executing the same actions they were doing before, but they're not, um, they're not immediately, because all the other animals, they responded on the first trial. The first time it happened, they did something, either halting or jumping or compensating. But these guys, they don't seem to, immediately do that. It takes them many trials for them to even understand that the, the, <coughs> that the environment changed. And sometimes when they do notice, for example, this is a slow motion video of the first time, which was like three or four trials into the manipulation, they noticed. And the reason he noticed is actually because it got banged on the, on the nose with the step. So it's, it's not actually that they, so it took the, yeah. 
So you see, he was kind of stepping normally, and then he, as he rotated, he got hit by it on the on the snout, and that kind of jolted him. And then then he could detect it, but it took. It seems like it took a bigger error because this is all. I mean, the way a lot of people interpret these results is the brain is kind of trying all the time to deal with the prediction error. So there's a, you have a model of what's going on. And as long as the environment is matching the model you have, then things are kind of fine. Once it breaks, you detect a mismatch between what you expect and what you are observing. Then you, you, you have to replan or do something. Or, um, and what seems to happen in this case of these very big lesions is that the prediction error that is needed for you to start re changing your behavior is much bigger. So it's like they, they, they need to either a bigger jolt or many repeated trials of the, of the crossing, bro of the broken crossing to notice that the steps are broken. Okay, so now we, just to finish, because I already have more of you. love to your time, sorry. So this, the connection that I, I, I kind of started to make in terms of, um, of robotics that, that I, I quite liked because it's, it's kind of like in the direction that I that I wanted to go was the difference between so um the canonical view of motor cortex as I was saying before is this idea of controlling skilled precise movements so you're kind of like doing very precise coordinated movements to do a surgery a micro surgery or playing the piano and so on what I was saying um, if you compare that to what we can do with robotic systems, robots are pretty good at doing that preciseness. Like if you are, if they are programmed, right? If they, if they, if you can define the, the space of the task in a way that is relatively controlled and the goal is stated clearly, if if you have something they can they can match, um, then we're pretty good at making robotic systems that are precise and fast and so on. But what robots struggle with doing is things like this. So I, I kind of have this video. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is a response that I think a robot would struggle, which is kind of oh, you're lying on a couch, like you have your kid on top of you, and suddenly your baby falls over and you have to kind of, oh, just do this, right? So if you think about the motor planning, like what is needed for this to actually even be possible? Like he's in a weird, there's so much, I mean, I could spend like an, almost an hour talking about this example. So in like a split second, you have to make a decision that your, your son is going to die or not, or you're going to die or not. You're stuck in a broken ladder, you're falling over a cliff, you have to make a last dash to kind of try to save the situation, you see? And you may be in a very weird configuration, like you may be in a weird posture, you may be in a weird carrying a bag or carrying or I don't know, whatever it is. And you have to reconfigure, you may have at any point in your life when things completely go wrong, you may have to replan in a situation that you never trained before or that you are not necessarily preparing for. And that ability of dealing with these unexpected situations is what we are thinking now that the motor cortex in non-primate mammals may have originally evolved for. Is that a hypothesis? We do, we have no, we did to take along, this is more like a, like a long-term research plan that could be taken to actually think of how you could actually show that this is the case. But it was the idea that, that came out of this, of the, of this research, is the idea that actually maybe the original older role for motor cortex would, would be to deal with these unexpected motor situations that you have, where you have to kind of come up with something on the fly. You have to imagine, kind of rethink your motor control uh, for something you did not expect. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop here, unless you wanna continue, I'm, MFA, I'm here until lunch and so on. We can discuss. These are some examples um, of stuff we are doing now. So um, the context of this, the extended, so now this could branch off into many, many different areas. And one thing that my supervisor was originally very interested in is the ability of mammals to um, build representations of the world that we they, they seem to have they are very keen to learn how the world works even when faced with crazy situations like rats were not trained to play video games that they can learn that like but so it's not like them 
So besides the genetic evolution, they, they seem to have evolved an ability to kind of understand new dynamics uh, in the world. And this is, of course, maybe related to the ability to deal with unexpected situations and so on. And one of the things that my supervisor wanted to continue investigating is exactly how these models come into play. Like, how are they formed? Um, how are they learned? Uh, and how do they adjust to changes? So we were kind of trying to... So in my original assay, we are mechanically changing the world by making the steps broken or not. But it's kind of, um, it's a one-off thing. So you do it once, uh, but that's it. And then the animals know that you've done that. It's hard to then, you, you have to build another mechanical thing to kind of come up with something novel. And so the idea was, what if we could emphasize that situation by having a more dynamic environment that we can change more quickly? And that's why we started doing these video games where um, we have like a kind of projector on the floor. This is again using bonsai, so we kind of um, generate a closed loop system where we're tracking the, 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 the rat's body, kind of like in the dancer case, it's very similar. And uh, there's virtual elements, and the rats can hunt for them, they can move in either um, just, just following the laws of physics, bouncing around, or they can be active now, they can kind of be like little agents or rent from the rats or things like that. Uh, and we're trying to see if we can emphasize the situation where things are changing unexpectedly, and we can do this much, much more quickly in a virtual environment than if we have to change something mechanically. Uh, the other thing we are doing in the lab that I didn't talk about a lot, this was not my project. This is, well, it was, I was involved in a project um, in terms of helping with the hardware and software, but um, another thing the lab is doing is expanding the way, how much we can record from the brain at the same time. Because what, one difficulty with brain studies is we are actually seeing just very little of the brain when we're measuring activity like you. The kind of state of the art technology still today is implanting wires in the brain like to listen to the, I mean, of course you can do like the EEG surface studies, but if you really wanna go like discriminate between the different layers of cortex or even understanding the activity of cortical structures, you have to go deep. So surface is not enough. And the state of the art is kind of you have to stick a wire in there. There's really no other way to do it. <coughs> However, there is. We're trying to improve the wires we put in the brain. So this is a project that was run in the, in the lab where we, there was a joint European project developing silicon probes, where basically you're taking a circuit like you have in your um, mobile uh, web cameras or mobile cameras, smartphone cameras, uh, using CMOS uh, technology to basically fill a whole substrate of a silicon um, the silicon substrate, you, you you kind of you make the CMOS circuit that can kind of turn the silicon wafer into <coughs> pixels that sample now not light but electricity. So you kind of like have a little webcam for into the brain. So instead of having one wire in the brain, you now have one thousand four hundred and forty wire forty channels, active sites along that wire, not the wired thing. And you can record the electrical activity. So this is now, actually these probes are quite long. They are 8 millimeters long. They actually, they, they, they cannot, they, they go the whole, the whole um, depth of the, the, the rat brain. They, they cannot actually penetrate the whole thing. So this is actually what you see here, actually outside of the brain. Because you cannot drive them. You hit the base of the skull. You hit the base of the, the skull if you go all the way through. It's like so, a hairbrush. The matrix of yeah, it's a silicon wafer with a CMOS circuit mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of electronics. There's a lot of details to this. Of, uh, actually, there's active electronics under each site, uh, how it is. I mean, this is a joint European project. There's a lot of people involved in this. Um, this is an experiment we did. Um, this is a visualization uh, in Bonsai that is online doing, doing data from this probe. And have way um, but yeah it's like you have um, a thin wafer that goes into the brain eight millimeters long each site has 20 micrometers uh, like little square so 20 micrometers so you have an idea about the size of a cell body so a neuron is about 10 12 between 15 20 microns mm -hmm. the, the body of a cell uh, so you have electrodes that are sizes of cells and they span all the, this is like a matrix, this is a grid of four by, 
however many, to make 440 channels. Some of them are references, so not all of them are active. And you're seeing here a visualization of the data coming in from the top of the brain, actually outside of the brain, and then it go into the brain. This is then the superficial layers of cortex, and then you go down from the cortex to deeper cortex. This is hippocampus, and the reason we say this is hippocampus is because the, you see the, the colors, actually. They tell you about the voltage. So the way we represent this, we have so many we have so many channels that we cannot represent them as waveforms anymore because this doesn't fit on the pixels. You don't have, pixels, you don't have enough pixels on the screen to represent 440 channels uh, at the same time. So we chose to represent them as textures moving in time. And now the colors are telling you what the, the height uh, of this. So um, the green is like a positive deflection voltage and red is a negative deflection voltage. And these patterns you see here in these bands uh, were actually, as, as soon as we saw them, uh, an, uh, an experienced physiologist who was standing next to us and said, oh, these are hippocampal ripples. So these are like theta ripples. If you read about this literature, there's this kind of um, uh, 50 hertz, around 50 hertz, I think, uh, ripples that uh, periodically happen in the campus, and you can see them here. And then below you have uh, thalamus. So this is like, a, <coughs> you see kind of these interesting little waves. So the, the way you read these plots is like the, you have tiny little reflections. There are spikes, so basically the activity of each cell depolarizing. And then you can see like traveling waves going from down up and up down both in cortex and in the uh, thalamus, and you have these couple ripples. We have no idea what this means, but it's just good to have more data about. And then, okay, we should stop. We should really stop. But this is uh, um, this is actually was the beginning of the project that I was um, and I was collaborating with Cedric. Now, actually, this is a different thing, a different way to explore how brains build models of the world but now with humans. So we want to, as VR technology gets better, so we started playing with it. Uh, and one of the first things we did was mm -hmm. like building a visualization system for um, big data, if you can call it that. So it's hard to explain what's going on, but it's basically a point cloud that you're navigating in VR and that each point represents a spike. So uh, one neuron in the brain that fired at some point in your data set um, and you see this flashing white dots is it's a recording that is playing through time and we've sorted it's, it's a longer story but you can sort based on the shape and location of the activations here try to sort them into different <laughs> cells so to say because this is just this means nothing right this is just electrical uh, activity in your pixels but you don't know if what corresponds to different cells. They, they are not cells, right? We, we cannot say for sure that these are... I mean, we know they're cells. They're cells inside for sure. But if you wanted to isolate, oh, this is one neuron, and this is another neuron, like you don't know. But it turns out you can actually analyze the patterns in the deflections and the voltage. Each cell, because it has a fixed position relative to the electrode, the little waveform is going to look differently, depending on how far away it is. You, and, it, and that relationship is actually stable over time, so you could actually sort them into saying, oh, this is one neuron, this is another neuron, and so on. And this, what you're seeing here is a point cloud where each color is the result of our sorting. So they, they presumably represent different cells in the brain, spikes in that cell, uh, and uh, when they are blinking is when they are active. It doesn't mean much, it's just another thing. But we started playing with VR, and then um, we became very fascinated at how good the technology is getting, really. Like, it's very low latency, very fast, and allowing us to uh, put track objects in the real world very fast. So what we started imagining is kind of migrating the experiments we did with the animals, but now doing them in humans and kind of creating physical environments that um, people go into. And uh, we can kind of, again, create these control loops where we can perturb them and do some um, some manipulation to them. And there's a lot. Now I should stop. I should stop because this, <laughs> this is going to completely, unless you want, <laughs> you can continue discussing as you want. But I think I should really, I think it's important. Yeah, this is thanks to all the people that were involved. 
this is the Halimo. This is my lab. Uh, these are other people that collaborated in the lab. Actually, this is also lab now. Some people that collaborated in helping analyze data. This is my other lab. So I was actually doing a collaboration between two labs. Um, so this is my supervisor, Adam. This is my other supervisor, Joe. Joe Patton, also in the Shimpalimo. Uh, this is everyone that is in there. And I don't have a picture for the Sainsbury, but it's, it's okay. Thanks. <laughs>